All right, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. So uh, I, I think I'll start off by just, if I wanted to just point out, I have my website up there if people want to look. I've done a number of papers that are uh, more technical that are related to things such as Bitcoin pricing, uh, uh, ICO finance, and some new work on uh, looking at the role of uh, privacy as a public good in, uh, and how that is impacted by different types of uh, electronic monies. And so I'd point some people to those things. But today, uh, I'm going to speak on this topic, which is the role of trust in publicly and uh, privately issued outside monies, which is really a talk that sort of stems from my experience working in, uh, in central banking. And I hope through this talk to give you a sense of uh, in some sense, what central banks, I guess, think uh, about money in general, and maybe a little bit about what they think about cryptocurrencies, which may, may be helpful if a lot of you are developers and thinking about producing new products, and eventually I'll talk a little bit about stable coins. And so maybe it'll give you some perspective um, on where central banks are coming from and thinking about these issues. So last year in, in Germany, Augustin Karstens gave a speech in which he called Bitcoin uh, a bubble, a Ponzi scheme, and an environmental disaster. And this got a lot of headlines. And I think he may have been a little bit hard on, on Bitcoin in that speech, although I do think it's uh, an environmental disaster, and I'll come back to that. But this wasn't actually the focus of the speech. This got the headline because it's such a, uh, a, sh a shocking quote. But in the same speech, he says that trust is the fundamental tenet that underpins credible currencies, and this trust has to be earned and supported. And he goes on to suggest that central banks are the best stewards of this trust. And really what I'm going to try to achieve in the next 30 minutes or so is answer the very simple question, is this true? So I'm going to start by talking about this guy. So this is a picture of uh, Johan Palmstruck. Uh, and Johan Palmstruck is a, was a Dutch finance, financier that founded Stockholm's Banco in, in 1657. And he introduced what is essentially the first paper money. So he introduced these paper notes. So gold coins and silver coins were being circulated, but people were scraping bits off the edges and so on and, and, and taking value out. And just dealing in uh, metal coins is cumbersome, so we issued paper. So certificates uh, that were uh, supposed to be backed by these coins. But he got a little bit uh, too uh, uh, enthusiastic in, in this process, and he issued more paper certificates than he had coins. And when there was some, uh, uh, essentially a run on the bank, it was revealed that he had done this, uh, and this led to the collapse uh, of his bank, and it led to the introduction or the creation of the first central bank, uh, the Riksbank in Sweden. From then on, in many countries around the world, the central bank has been the main entity in terms of issuing currency. Central banks provide a mean for, means for people to make large and small payments. And the acceptance of any form of money depends on uh, the receiver's confidence it will be accepted by someone else. That is, when you think about paper money, especially paper money that's been detached from any underlying value, like gold or, or silver, your willingness to accept that money depends entirely on your belief, your trust, if you will, that people down the road will uh, accept it from you. And the question is, how does the central bank support this belief? How do we get to a point where society is willing to take these worthless pieces of paper and provide goods or services for them? Well, one way that we've done it in the past is through the penalty of law. So this is a a French note that was issued after the Revolutionary War, and essentially what the caption uh, up top says basically is that counterfeiting is punishable by death. More recently, we've been able to uh, come up with better techniques uh, to uh, assure, I mean, what we're trying to do here is that one of the underlying principles of paper money is that we at least have to all be able to agree uh, that the pieces of paper that we're trading are, are the pieces that we've agreed to. And so more recently, what we do is we use security features. So we use things like color shifting, uh, 3D imagery. These are, this, is, this is the Canadian dollar. I just spent a year at the Bank of Canada, plus the Canadian dollars with their polymer currency and so on is, is somewhat a little more fancy, I think, than the current US technologies, although there's a lot of security features embedded in US notes. That's one thing. And then the other idea 
is that we governments have an advantage in ensuring this trust, this belief that people down the road will accept bills because they're one of the people that accepts them. So what the governments can do is they can give money legal tender status. And one thing that's important to remember is that legal tender status doesn't mean that you have to take cash. So it doesn't mean that a store uh, on Main Street has to accept cash when it sells goods. What it means is that it has to be accepted to extinguish debt. So once you allow someone to incur a debt, you have to accept cash to extinguish that debt. So it's a subtle distinction. Uh, but what it means is, is that when you uh, have money, you know you can use it to pay off your debts, and one of the biggest debts that people have is their taxes, and so, that, so you always know that there's this one big sort of customer out there that's going to be willing to take your money if you accept cash from me. Okay. But most money is digital. And so we have to think about how digital money works. And when I say digital money, I immediately think of two things. One is reserves, so we think about the money that central banks use in their own systems to move value between each other or between commercial banks. And then, of course, it's commercial deposits. So just think about the money that you have in your bank account. And a remarkable achievement of central banks around the world is that this money trades at par value. And this is a notion that the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, is referred to as, as singleness. One dollar is one dollar regardless of its form. It's easy to ignore this or take this for granted. But when you have a deposit account at Bank of America, and I have a deposit account at Union Bank, and you want to send me money, I don't have to say, oh, well, wait a minute. You've got this Bank of America money. I'm not so sure I want to take that. That never thought never crosses your mind. Bank deposits trade one for one. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And that is not something that happens by accident. That's some, something that has been essentially provided uh, by the supervisory and regulatory actions of the, of the central banks. This leads to great transactional efficiencies. Uh, but as I said, it depends on the soundness of the commercial banks. And it also depends on the ability to convert these commercial bank deposits, commercial bank money essentially, into a sound fiat currency. And how does that happen? That happens through adequate management of the money supply. So this is a map. The IMF produces data on inflation in countries around the world. And what this map shows is the, just a, a high-level look at the inflation rates in various countries. So green is good. That means low inflation. United States, Canada, uh, uh, low inflation rates. Uh, moving towards orange or red is, is bad in the sense of having very high inflation rates. So you see places like Iran, Sudan, Argentina have high inflation rates. And one of the countries that has a very high inflation rate, the, the, the example of the highest inflation rate right now is, is Venezuela. And Venezuela doesn't provide data on their inflation, so that data isn't in the IMF chart. But Bloomberg uh, does this rather simple way of conveying inflation. So inflation is generally the change in price of a representative basket of goods and services. But what Bloomberg does is they look at the price of coffee in a single coffee shop in Caracas. And they just trace the price of that uh, uh, coffee over time. And that price has gone up from basically 90, 95 boulevards to over 16,000 boulevards in the recent, recent history. So massive inflation. Uh, in Venezuela. Another example is Zimbabwe, not as recent, but still pretty recent. That's just tracking the inflation rate uh, on the left-hand side in a graph, and then on the right is a picture of a $100 trillion bill. So basically this currency got inflated to the point where it was essentially worthless. Okay. Uh, in this case, the currency was just discontinued altogether. In the case of Venezuela, uh, basically they've been, it's been re-denominated. So the currency, they just keep chopping zeros off uh, uh, because the, the inflation has been so high. Well, not everybody's a bad manager of the money supply, so to speak. So I'm a, an economics professor. I teach at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I teach a course in monetary economics, and one of the uh, pictures I use or slides I use in my monetary economics class is this. And all this is showing is it's showing the inflation experience of countries that have adopted inflation targeting. So we had high uh, levels of inflation in the 80s and, 90, 80s and 90s, 
or mostly through the 80s, into the 90s. And this led uh, a number of countries to adopt inflation targeting rules. And these rules have been very successful. So this is where the central bank literally expresses uh, an inflation target uh, that it's going to maintain. And we can see the top is actually New Zealand, the middle is Canada, the bottom is the United Kingdom. They all uh, uh, introduced these inflation bands. Those are the green bars. And then you can see that these were incredibly successful. If you look at how the inflation rate, which is the red, bar, the red line, the red series uh, stays well within the bands. In fact, in New Zealand, it's actually part of the Bank Act that the, that the, that the central bank uh, uh, the, uh, president can be fired if, if he or she does not keep inflation within the target band. So what's the difference? So why did things go so bad in Venezuela and Zimbabwe, and why do things work so well in some of these other countries? Well, the one of the main reasons is central bank independence. And this is really, I think, an important argument because I know that you know, part of the uh, arguments in favor of, of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, is the idea that we, in some sense, can't trust the central bank. And, and people will often point to examples like Zimbabwe uh, and Venezuela as, as, as evidence of this. But these aren't good examples because these are places that lack uh, central bank independence. Uh, the countries where the money supply is properly managed have central bank independence, at least to a sufficient degree that's necessary uh, for you to, I think, have trust in the currency. On the right, I've got a couple of pictures. At the top, it's uh, Richard Nixon and Arthur Burns. Arthur Burns was the Fed chairman uh, back when Richard Nixon was president. And in events leading up to the 1972 election, uh, Nixon pressured Burns to uh, do a combative mon monetary policy to get the economy rolling so that he would have a better chance of, of re-election. Burns acquiesced, went along with this, and was criticized heavily afterwards. And in an interview, he famously said that if the Fed didn't do what the president wanted, we would lose our independence. More recently, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news, uh, President Trump has made a number of pleas, uh, or pleas, complaints, that the Federal Reserve isn't behaving the way it wants. As you know, uh, we've been in, or were, in a, uh, trying to raise interest rates, get them off of zero, so the Fed uh, raised the, uh, the target range for the federal funds rate uh, seven or eight times, uh, in the last few years, trying to get rates up to around 3%. And President Trump felt that this was bad for the economy. So he was putting a lot of pressure on the Fed to stop doing this and to lower rates. He said, I'm doing deals. I'm not being accommodated. We're not being accommodated. I don't like that. Now, the Fed didn't respond to this. The Fed didn't act and do what the president said. And that's because... The Fed doesn't have to. Uh, Mariner Eccles, who was the Fed chair in the 1930s and 40s, uh, explained this, because this has been going on for a long time, this idea that there is pressure from the uh, presidents on the Federal Reserve to do policy that's accommodative for their election cycle. And in the 30s and 40s, uh, Mariner Eccles described the Federal Reserve Board, or the Federal Reserve System more generally, as an agency of Congress. And what that means is, is that it's not that the Fed is not accountable. The Fed is accountable, but the Fed is accountable to Congress. Okay, Congress represents the people. So it serves the legislative branch, but it doesn't serve the executive branch. That's the distinction. That's the key distinction. And so when I go back to the idea of whether or not you can trust the central bank to manage the money supply, you can trust them because they have the proper incentives. They have your incentives. The central bank doesn't manage the money supply for its own benefit. It manages the money supply on behalf of the public. It works for the people. It's an agency of Congress. I want to add one thing in his, in his, to his credit. At the end of this White House interview in the uh, Oval Office, uh, President Trump did add, that being said, I'm not sure currency should be controlled by a politician. Well, I've talked a little bit about trust and talked about the context of why I think you can trust 
central banks in countries where central banks have independence because in such a situation, their incentives are aligned with yours. But there's another way to think about doing things, and that's, well, what if we don't get rid of people altogether? What if we use protocols? So Bitcoin has this incredibly uh, ingenious idea uh, that it will launch this coin, and the monetary policy essentially will be fixed. The coin is issued, coins are issued at a relatively constant rate, roughly to every 10 minutes we get new coins. The amount of new coins gets halved. Uh, but this is fixed. No one can, well, in principle, no one can change this. We don't have to worry about someone inflating uh, or deflating the currency by I increasing the number of coins that are issued. But there are other problems. Okay? We don't have to trust humans in the context of these cryptocurrencies, but we have to trust that the protocol works. We have to trust in some sense that they can't be hacked or that other bad things can't happen to them. So a recent episode uh, was this 51% on Bitcoin gold. So I'm sure many people in this audience know about this, but uh, basically attackers stole $18 million from multiple exchanges. So they did transactions with, they sold Bitcoins to a whole number of different exchanges, Bitcoin gold, to a number of different exchanges, and then they went and double spent those coins to reverse those transactions. What does that do? It results in a price drop. I mean, it, it, some people might have speculated that it could kill the currency altogether, but what I've done in this diagram here is done just a simple event study. One of the difficult things in looking at something that happens after an event is that you don't know how much the price might have dropped anyway for other reasons. So what this picture is actually showing you is it's, is it's showing you uh, in, uh, in blue what the actual price series did. And then what the orange line above it does is what we did was we estimated the Bitcoin price, the Bitcoin gold price, by regressing it in the past against the uh, uh, Bitcoin price. So we get this predicted Bitcoin gold price, or actually returns, not price. We normalize those at 100. And so what that means is then you can then look at the orange line, which is what, the pri what we predict the price would have been had the attack not occurred. This is under the assumption that the attack didn't affect the price of Bitcoin. Um, and then we see what the actual price was, and we get a sense of what the abnormal returns are. So we see that this, this resulted in a drop in value. The hack resulted in a drop in value of around 20%. And what was the market cap of Bitcoin gold at this time? Boy, I think I, you, you can you tell me? 60? I don't know. Yeah. Like 80, I wonder how the 18 million compares. Yeah, you know, I used to know. I used to know, but I don't, I don't remember offhand. I don't remember offhand, I'm sorry. But that's a good question because, like, how big of a how big of a fraction of this it was it? Yeah. Okay. Well, what did they do? Well, getting back to my theme of trust, the exchanges responded by increasing the number of blocks required for confirmation. That's one thing they did. So again, we're getting back to the idea of how do you have trust in these protocols? We see an instance where there's a hack. Something in some sense goes wrong. Um, they increase the number of confirmations and they change the proof of work algorithm. Okay, they're doing these uh, things that are essentially designed to restore trust and by and large it still worked, it still exists uh, today. So what about Bitcoin? Well, one of the things that I've been working on recently is thinking about how secure Bitcoin is. Can the same thing that happened to Bitcoin gold happen to Bitcoin? And my opinion is no. Uh, and one of the reasons is, 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 is just that Bitcoin is, is so big. Um, and also, the fact that it uses this ASIC-specific technology, uh, application-specific integrated circuit. What this basically means is that you have to have a very specific device in order to mine Bitcoin. Unlike Bitcoin Gold, where you could rent, essentially, the mining power needed to hack it, and that's what they did. With Bitcoin, you can't do that. If you want to match the mining power of Bitcoin, I did a, I, I did a simple uh, quick calculation. I looked up, there's a Dragon Mint 16T. It seems to be the most powerful, or at least it was, uh, ASIC chip. Uh, 16 uh, uh, terahashes per second cost $2,729. So given the hash rate of 51 uh, million terahashes per second, you'd need 3,247 of these at a cost of $8.9 million. 
So basically to match the Bitcoin mining network, since you can't rent the mining power, you'd basically have to spend $9 billion just to buy the, just to buy the hardware. And of course, anyone who's done mining knows there's a lot more involved than just buying a few chips. Now, this actually is really important. So I have a new paper out, which is called Mining and ASICs, or Cryptocurrency Mining and ASICs, with Martin Van Oort from the Bank of Canada. And we're looking at the fact that if we th want to think about how resilient, essentially, something like Bitcoin is, again, going back to this theme of trust, we need to know how susceptible it might be to a 51% attack. And there's a large body of work that looks at this. They look at the economics of mining in general, because when economists think about the 51% attack, we think about it from the perspective of what the economic incentives are. So we have to think about miners, and we have to think about the fact that miners are making money anyway. Right? They're already mining, so if you have a lot of mining power, you can make a lot of money just by operating within the system. Why should you essentially kill the goose that lays the golden egg? But most of the work, in fact, all of the work that looks at Bitcoin mining models it as a flow. They essentially model it as if you can simply, uh, per period that you're mining, you can pay some cost to do a certain level of mining, uh, have a certain level of mining power. You can think of that as an electricity cost. You can think of that as, you know, maybe you have to rent the chips, so maybe the, the, the uh, depreciation is, is built into that. But it's still, in every one of these papers, it's modeled as a flow cost, okay? But fixed costs are crucial in understanding the economics and security of these proof-of-work systems. In the absence of fixed costs, we have a very simple way to think about an equilibrium relationship of Bitcoin mining. If Q is just the number of units of computing power that are required to mine a block in expectation, and E is the electricity cost, or the cost of operating those units, and if S is the Bitcoin exchange rate and B is the reward you get in Bitcoins for a block, then we just have this simple condition that says basically the cost has to equal the reward. And moreover, in this kind of a world, miners face no decline in profitability when there's a, a decline in the crypto exchange rate because of the price of Bitcoin falls, miners just leave, and everybody goes back to essentially making this zero profit. But if we think about fixed costs, things change considerably. Entry with fixed costs is going to enter up to the point that it covers the fixed cost. So essentially, miners are making more than they are under that simple uh, flow equation. And if there's going to be a drop in the price of Bitcoin, mining doesn't drop right away. So what I'm showing in this diagram, the dotted line would show what would happen if we had no fixed costs. So if so on the uh, left axis, we just have mining power, how much mining power is being utilized to mine Bitcoin. And on the horizontal axis, I'm just looking at the percentage loss. So L is some loss, uh, the percent drop in price of Bitcoin. So if we have no fixed costs, then uh, uh, if we have a percentage loss, the mining power just drops commensur commensurately. But in the case of having uh, uh, a large fixed cost, it doesn't drop right away. As long as you can basically, in, in economics, uh, the way to think about this is we think of like fixed and variable costs. Even if the prices fall into the point where you're not making a profit, as long as you can still cover your variable costs, you keep operating. That's the idea at work here. So you keep, you keep mining, even though you're no longer making money uh, relative to what you spent on, including the cost you spent on the chip. Okay. Or you might get out altogether if there's some scrap value. So that's another key point here which is the, the middle point, the black line, that's showing you just a hypothetical scrap value. So what if the chips uh, can be sold and used for something else? So as you know, when you do something like Ethereum mining and use graphics cards, you can sell those. They have a good market value. Whereas if you mine Bitcoin and you're using ASICs chips, they don't have an alternative value. The scrap value is very low. So the scrap value matters, okay? If there's no scrap value, all right, then you're going to have a, a, a very large effect, or a very, sorry, not a very large effect, you're going to have a very minimal effect in response to price changes uh, in uh, when the price, uh, in sort of mining, mining rate when the price drops. Okay, we can also think about how that impacts the present value of the mining operation. So it decreases 
when the price drops and, until we reach some floor that's, that's reflected by this alternative use scrap value. But what I wanted to tie it in, again, going back to the idea of can we trust these systems, is the implication for a double spending attack. And so what we can do is we can look at this from an economic perspective. So from an economic perspective, again, you're thinking about people, they're miners, or a mining pool, a large mining pool that has a large share of mining power. They have to make this economic decision whether or not they should attack, do a double spending attack or not. What should that decision be based on? Well, it should be based on whether or not it's profitable. So in that equation on the left, D is just the amount that you could double spend. Okay, how much can you feasibly acquire a Bitcoin to, and, and get the exchanges to accept so that how much can you actually double spend? L is the, what you expect the, the, the price drop to be as a result of, the percentage price drop to be as a result of the double spend. So one minus LS is the price after the double spend. So that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna double spend these coins, but when you sell them, you get the, you get the new price after the attack. It depends how quick, I guess, you can sell them, how quickly the attack becomes public or so on, but you get the idea there's gonna be some kind of a discount. And then on the right-hand side, we're just looking at, essentially, the loss, what you lose. So in terms of the math up above, fee is just some density, the expected time it's gonna take for a successful attack to unfold, and then L is the loss function. And the loss includes just two components. One is the present value of operating a mine muted after the attack. So it's gonna be lower, okay, because the attack is gonna impact the Bitcoin price, it's gonna make it lower. So that's a loss. And then the other loss is that you get lower mining rewards during the attack. So during the time it takes to make the attack, you're still mining. You're still gonna get those mining rewards, but you're gonna get them at a lower exchange price. So the idea is that the economics of the attack are that you should undertake the attack if it's profitable, but you have to account the fact that the attack is gonna impact the price. And so what this picture shows is that thinking about the minimum, uh, uh, the minimum return uh, for an attack, so we model it here in terms of D, which is the uh, amount you can get in an attack, number of coins, uh, divided by the block reward, okay, just to give, just to put it in some kind of a perspective, then what you can see is, is that in the case of, uh, you know, cloud servers, if you can just rent all the mining power, you just want to attack whenever you can. Uh, in the case of uh, fixed costs, when you have to go out and acquire the chips, uh, if there's a low scrap value or if there's a moderate scrap value, you get the black line. If there's no scrap value, you get the green line. The point is it's getting higher and higher, which means that it's harder and harder to attack. It's less likely your attack. So the point I'm trying to make here is that Bitcoin is far more secure, much more secure than Bitcoin gold because the economics don't support attacking it, right? And a large reason for that has to do with the fact that it uses an ASIC-specific technology uh, which imposes this idea of fixed cost in the profit calculation. Okay. So I wanna sum up and I want to get back to just a couple of quick points. One is, I, I started off with a quote by Augustine Karstens, where he called Bitcoin an environmental disaster. I do want to assert that is true. Uh, this is a chart that uh, uh, just shows the energy consumption of Bitcoin being equal to, uh, essentially equal to the Czech Republic. So a massive amount of energy being used for a really, from a, certainly from a payments processing perspective, uh, you know, 14 transactions per second compared to Visa of 20,000 and Alipay of 100,000 a second. So for a minimal number of transactions, it's using a lot of energy. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't some good things about it, but that's, that's certainly a bad thing. Uh, and then there's the volatility issue. So we have high volatility with Bitcoin, uh, which is another problem that it comes with using this alternative trust model. That's just comparing the volatility of Bitcoin with the vol volatility of gold. Everybody knows Bitcoin's price is volatile. Very recently, obviously, that's been the case. And so I want to finish up just by saying a couple words about stable coins. Because stable coins were designed in part to solve this volatility problem, create a cryptocurrency, essentially, something that transacts in a way similar to Bitcoin, can be transacted on a distributed ledger, possibly open, uh, open access, um, but backed by something to give it stable value. So backed by fiat currency. And the first point I just want to make about this is that this reintroduces human actors. 
So the minute we talk about a stable coin, even the one that's going to be traded on a distributed ledger, it has to, if it's backed by something, someone has to do the backing. There's an intermediary. The stuff that it's backed with is probably going to be held in conventional institutions. We need people that we have to trust to do the backing. We, of course, all know the history of Tether. Uh, so on April 25th, the Attorney General stated that Tether committed fraud. It mingled funds with a crypto exchange of common ownership and lost access to $850 million held by a Panamanian processor. And at present, I think the estimates are that around 70% of Tether is backed by dollar equivalents. Of course, people will dispute that, but the whole point is we have to trust these human actors. You know, if the stable coins work, we've, we've, we've reintroduced trust in human actors. Uh, I want to finish up, just maybe with, I'm out of time, so I'll be very quick. I want to finish up. Uh, stable coins, there's a lot of different models about how they're backed, but they all involve some level of trust. They can be backed. Uh, promise to be backed by individual currencies. Uh, they can be backed by just the institution itself. Something like JP Morgan coin uh, is something that's an alternative form of deposit, which is just basically backed the same way your commercial deposits are backed. You trust the institution. Or they can be backed by larger uh, portfolios of assets. So this is a token. I recently worked on the uh, new report that just came out last week, the G7 report on stable coins, on global stable coins. This is a table that we produced in this report, which just classifies stable coins in terms of two real key characteristics. Who uses them? Are they used at the retail level, like for everyone, or are they used just for banks at the wholesale level? And is the exchange rate fixed or variable? Is it tied to a, a, a particular currency one-to-one, -one, or is it allowed to vary? Even things like Tether, even though we, there's a promise of it being one-to-one -one redeemable, there's still a Tether price that varies relative to the US dollar, sometimes a lot, mostly a little. Um, and then, of course, the Libra model, okay? I'll finish up just by saying why is Libra important? Libra is important because it's retail, okay? It, it's the, the, the potential is it's gonna be available to everyone. Um, and it's also uh, multi, it's, it's its own unit of account. All right, it'd be backed by a basket of assets. A Libra would be its own unit of account. It would be something that would, in some sense, be a competing currency with many sovereign currencies. Okay, so to summarize, uh, new forms of money are, are not really trustless. We have to trust in people is replaced with trust in code. Uh, trust in any kind has to be properly incentivized. So what I was trying to argue in the case of central banks and independence is that we can trust some central banks because they're operating in our interest. That's what their mandate is. Uh, we can trust code when the code is set up and the circumstances are set up in a way that it works. I think we can trust Bitcoin because I think it uh, is at a situation where there's, there aren't incentives to hack it. Uh, whereas smaller currencies like Bitcoin gold or any currency where you could rent enough mining power to hack it or to sort of double spend it, I don't think are good ideas. Uh, many new models have hybrid trust models, as I just said, with the, with the idea of stable coins. And so be careful who you trust. All right, thank you.